April is Autism Awareness Month and it is a perfect time for us to assess our knowledge on autism. Autism rates have been rising. Does this mean that such a thing as autism epidemic is real or is there a much simpler explanation? To answer these questions and more is Dr. Chris McDougall at Lori Center for Autism. Thank you so much for having us today. Thanks so much. So I am wondering, is autism epidemic real? Because the numbers are rising. It is one out of 68 individuals in the United States alone that ha are diagnosed with autism. Yeah. So are we facing an epidemic or is this a reflection of society awareness? I think it's a combination of the two. Um, I'm seeing a lot more individuals with autism than I did 25 years ago um, when it was considered a rare disorder. But I think the other side of it is, as you point out, um, we have this concept of a spectrum. So different degrees of severity. And a lot of people are being diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder now who in the past wouldn't have been diagnosed with autism. They're, they're much more verbal, usually, uh, have a higher intelligence level. Um, and 25 years ago, we didn't really think of these people that have prominent social impairment as having autism. Mm -hmm. The typical autism person back then was minimally to nonverbal their entire life. They were um, maybe intellectually impaired, although that's controversial because we can't really test these people because they can't communicate like we do. Um, and they had significant functional impairment. It's different now. Everybody knows someone in the neighborhood or a relative or friend uh, with autism, but um, we don't always agree with that diagnosis. So I understand that there are about five different um, disorders in the autism spectrum disorder. So what is the core symptoms that are binding all of these disorders to make it one big spectrum? Yeah. So um, the primary um, symptom area is social impairment. But just with that, uh, if you think about the different disorders that can occur in neurology or psychiatry, lots of them have social impairment, major depression, panic disorder and agoraphobia, social anxiety disorder. So we're not very good as a field at differentiating people that have social impairment. We tend to lump them together into the autism spectrum and that's, one, that's another reason that the prevalence is so high. But, but prominent social impairment. Okay. Uh, the other is communication impairment. That doesn't mean that these people don't talk, although about 25% never talk. Mm -hmm. But they may speak in uh, a different kind of way they may become preoccupied with a topic and want to talk only about that topic. They may um, try to get the topic of conversation changed to what they want to talk about. And if you want to talk about something else, they may just walk away from you. So their communication isn't always reciprocal in a normal way. And the third uh, symptom area is repetitive ritualistic behavior. That again can become confusing diagnostically because many people will come to me and say, oh, my son has OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Well, that's very different. Just because uh, they're both repetitive in nature doesn't mean they're the same thing. Um, these people do things repetitively that feel good to them. They order and arrange things so that it feels right to them. Uh, they may flap their hands to calm down their anxiety. Where people with OCD, they're washing their hands because they think they're contaminated. And they don't want to do this. It doesn't make them feel good, so it's very different from OCD. Yes. But those are the three core symptom domains. Now, I would think it is lumping all these disorders in one category is detrimental to finding the right treatment and actually to move forward. Wouldn't you say so? I, I absolutely agree. So. We have this manual in psychiatry called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. And there have been up now up to five editions. And in DSM-4, there were five essentially types of autism. Autistic disorder, Asperger's disorder, Rett's disorder, childhood disintegrative disorder, and pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified. That's all been eliminated. We have one term, autism spectrum disorder. And I think that's problematic. Uh, as you point out, how are we going to find the cure 
if ev or better treatments if everybody has the same diagnosis that one end of the spectrum is the same as the other you have this person who's got an IQ of 150 who's uh, highly verbal but has social problems and down here you've got the the, the person who's uh, intellectually impaired with seizures nonverbal rocking aggressive self injurious they're very different mm -hmm. they probably have very different causes of their illness. So I, I feel that moving to the spectrum terminology was a step backwards. But I'm hoping that in the next version of the DSM we'll get back to subtyping because we know there are going to be many, many, many different causes of autism spectrum disorder and certainly genetics will play a role but there's more and more concern about the environment. Yes or the environment in combination with a genetic vulnerability. And uh, to, to what control do we have to those environmental factors that may trigger autism or each time we choose to have a child we're taking a big risk Absolutely. of our child ending up with autism? Absolutely. So, you know, if you watch CNN, um, on the bottom of the screen they have this running commentary and it's not unusual to see a new cause of autism every month or so. And so we hear about things like premature birth, uh, maternal obesity during pregnancy, uh, infection, uh, exposure to toxins in the environment. Um, these are things that uh, young parents then are frightened about, mm -hmm. um, which it's good that they're more uh, observant of their child. Um, but these are things that haven't all been proven to be a cause. Yes. Um, and I think this gets back to our discussion about the spectrum. Uh, we need to begin looking at people with autism to try to determine specific causes. And you say, well, how can you do that? Well, you have a pretty good idea. If it, when you take the history, was there prominent exposure to a toxin in a high, high uh, urban area? Was there uh, were pesticides in the country for the fertilizer? Um, was, did the mother have a major infection with fever while hospitalized? So I think we need to think a little bit more about diagnostic possibilities rather than just lumping uh, characteristics together. Now, we talked that we, you have spoken that there are different factors that could influence or could trigger autism. Now, when I look at the rising number in autism, it seems that autism is prevalent among boys than among females, right? But the severe symptoms are more prevalent on females than on males. So does this mean that gender is also a factor in autism? And if so, to what extent? Um, you're very perceptive. Um, the gender issue right now is, is way at the top of the list. And uh, because we've known for decades that there are more boys than girls affected, about four to one. Uh, recently, our, our group is primarily interested in, in one particular type of cause of autism. And that's related to immune system abnormalities and inflammation. And uh, the director of the research for the Lurie Center is a very talented woman named Stacy Bilbo, Dr. Stacy Bilbo. And she's doing work with uh, animal models of autism. And what she's shown is that the male mice, if you will, are vulnerable to immune insults and the female mice are protected. They don't have symptoms that emerge with ins immune insult or biological changes, just the males. So that we're, we're replicating what we see in humans and animals and, and the males' brains are uh, radically different from the females when they've been uh, subjected to an immune insult. So what you do from there, you know, is uh, we're now doing more and more studies comparing males with autism and females with autism, looking at brain imaging, for example. So one of my colleagues, Jacob Hooker, uh, is an expert in brain imaging, and he's showing now that the immune system has uh, prominent abnormalities uh, in the brain scans of people with autism compared to normal controls. Now we want to get into the details. Well, are there differences between males and females um, with brain scanning uh, to see if we can replicate what we're seeing in animals? Now, when we talk about treatment, because that's what we have right now, we yeah. just have treatment, we do not have a cure. So when we talk about cure, is cure geared towards eliminating all the symptoms, or is cure basically focusing on specific symptoms that we know, okay, we got, these have to go? Yeah, yeah, it's a very good uh, question. 
Uh, the first thing you made me think of is when I'm doing a new evaluation on a, a child and mom and dad are there. It's not unusual for one of the parents to endorse a lot of symptoms and the other one to say, he's just a normal boy. What, you're making too much out of this. So disagreement among parents seeing the same child for all kind of reasons. Um, and then you're back to the spectrum concept. So if you have this high functioning individual who's intelligent, highly verbal, potentially functional, um, they don't necessarily feel they need to be eliminated or cured. And so there's a term that's emerged now called neurodiversity, that we're more accepting of people that are somewhat different, which I think is good. Um, but these people would say to me, Dr. McDougal, what are you talking about uh, eliminating me or preventing me? And, and it caught my attention when they said that to me, giving a talk. And I said, you're, you're helping me understand a, a very important point. I want to help you if you have associated problems like depression or anxiety, but I don't want to eliminate you. Now on the other end, if you're talking to parents who have a 27-year-old uh, son with autistic disorder who's never talked, um, is involved in uh, ritualistic behavior the entire day, is self-injurious, has bite marks up and down their arms, uh, whose eyes, they've detached retinas from self-injury, um, they might say to you, I wish my child didn't have to go through this life. You know, I love my child, but if he could have been normal, I think it would have been better for him. Uh, so if, if there's a way to minimize these symptoms over time or even prevent it in severe cases, I think most parents would say that would be something good. So I, I think it's again back to a problem with the spectrum mm -hmm. approach and we need to be more specific about who we're talking about because there are so many uh, ramifications for speaking in general terms. Mm -hmm. And uh, also back to treatment, I mean we know that earlier diagnosis is crucial when it comes to treatment, yes. right? And I was wondering if somebody is early diagnosed, right, and they receive the proper treatment, can treatment to some point reverse these symptoms and somebody ended up stepping out of the spectrum? Sure. So very good point. Early diagnosis and early intervention. So when people say early intervention, they're talking about behavioral. Um, getting down on the floor with the child and making eye contact. Engaging them in play, but focusing on their challenging areas. Eye contact, socialization, communication. That can make a difference um, in the longer term course of people with autism, but it has to be intense. Often 20 or 40 hours per week. So what does that turns into expensive? Very, very, very expensive. expensive, so most people can't afford it. Uh, it limits people who live in certain areas of the country where you have the professionals that know how to do that. Um, so not everyone has uh, access to it. Um, and the person is still gonna be autistic. Sometimes people say it can go away. Well, if you really know autism, you're still gonna notice they may have symptoms of autism. But, but they may no longer meet the diagnosis, as you point out. If you go down the checklist, they may not meet it because the number of the symptoms have gotten better. And they're probably gonna function better. So early diagnosis and intervention is very important. Now, how, when do these symptoms become apparent on a child? When yeah. can you should seek help? You know, in my experience, you can be somewhat confident of a diagnosis of autism when you're between the ages of 18 months and two years. Okay. Uh, the field is trying to diagnose it earlier and earlier so we can intervene earlier, maybe at the age of one. But I think at that point, there's so many things like, well, maybe the child shouldn't be talking yet even if it's normal development. They may not be doing th anything because they're so young rather than having symptoms of autism. But if we're looking carefully, certainly by 18 months, there should be enough symptoms to make a diagnosis. Wow. Now, when we talk about autism spectrum disorder, there's this notion that if you lose one thing, something else becomes better in you. Somebody without an eyesight, their earring is spectacular. So can the same argument be made for autism um, individuals, uh, those are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders, that with the disorder they become better at a specific thing or better people? I, I absolutely believe that. Mm. Um, and I, I like to think in simple terms. 
Um, I think that's the way to get answers. But if you just imagine a brain developing and something happens to it to make it change course, like you say, some area is going to end up with less, but another area is going to end up with more. And so we see people that have tremendous skills in uh, artwork. How you take it? Yes. <laughs> For example, right here, um, mathematics. You know, you have the individual, you say to them, what day of the week would it be uh, in January the 15th in 2050? That would be a Tuesday. They can tell you immediately, like calendar calculate. Mm. What's that all about? So there has to be something in the brain that works better than it does in me mm -hmm. to do that. Um, musical ability, sitting down and playing the piano with not, without hear, having lessons based on hearing something, perfect pitch. Um, so that's actually one of the things I enjoy a lot about working in this field is my patients um, are so interesting, uh, particularly as they become older and they can express things uh, because they, they have different ways of thinking that are creative and profound. So as a society, we need to appreciate that and I think we're doing a better job. There are probably things in vocational areas where some of those talents can be applied. However, we have to be careful. If that person's going to have to interact with people a lot and there'll be social pressure, he may not be able to do that. He may have a, an outburst and run out of the building. So we have to realize that just because you have a talent doesn't mean your uh, other areas of your body are, are going to work perfectly yes. fun functional. Yeah, there's certain functionalities that we need to have in order to you know, move on Absolutely. in our daily lives. Yeah. Now, I mean, I don't know if you have ever watched the show Good Doctor. I don't know if you're much of a television person. And so this is a newly show that depicts autism uh, on the media. And a show like that for a person who has not been exposed to autism, not a family member, not a child or so forth, you may look at it and say, what's wrong with this individual? There's nothing wrong because he is another individual, highly functioning, exceptional memory skills that has allowed him to obtain this job. Yeah. So shows like that, what do you feel are its contribution to societies? Do you feel like it deters treatment or um, awareness or the, the, the actual conversation of what autism is and that this is a real thing that we need to tackle it and pour all our resources in it? Yeah. I, I've only seen that show a little bit, um, and, and I'm, I have my own opinion, right? I guess I'm allowed to say it. Um, I don't feel that that's a good representation of what autism is, because it's going to give families hopes and individuals that they can be like this, a, a doctor, uh, and go to medical school and residency and all the stress and strain. Um, certainly, many of these people are intelligent and have great visual memories, um, but I don't think it... Uh, emphasizes the other things that are going to go along with that, like working with a team, um, having certain uh, empathy with patients, um, having the, the, the patients to uh, deal with all of the stressors. I think uh, I don't know one person in, in, the, in the world who truly has what I call autistic disorder who's a physician. I don't know anybody. Uh, I think a better... Do you think that's a, because they're not allowed to be in that field, or do you no. think because they're not capable? I think that, you know, if they're qualified, they should be given the opportunity. Um, but if, if they were capable, we would know doctors that, that uh, have autistic disorder. Now, some may have come from being quite socially impaired, uh, but they had either a high IQ and good verbal skills to get them to where they are, which, again, I'm starting to say... Well, that's if we broaden the definition a little bit. But if we're thinking about what I would call um, uh, autism, the way it was initially described in 1943, these, those people are not going to have the, the opportunity to, to go to medical school. I think a really good uh, example of what autism is, it goes back to the 80s with um, Rain Man, with Dustin Hoffman. Um, that movie was the first to really... Uh, show society that people with autism could be adults. 
before they would think it's just a childhood disorder. It's all focus on children, 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 but these children with autism will grow up, be Absolutely. adults with autism. Absolutely. And if you think about it, you're a child from birth until let's say 18 or 22, you're an adult from 18 or 22 to 85. So there are a lot more adults with autism in the world than kids. They get all the attention, the kids. Once you're 22 and you're done with high school, there's very little concern about you. Well, there's concern, but there's nothing people are doing about it. Why? It's extremely expensive to have job coaches and provide housing and additional education because many of these people require lots of care just to function in the world. But so I, I think that well, they, they clearly don't get the services that they might benefit from the way that kids do. And they do need these services. Now, when looking at autism, one way of t telling if your next child is going to have autism is if there is a history of autism in your family, whether your first child has autism or, or yourself had a, has autism. But also we see in situations where there is no history of autism within the family, but still the child has autism. Yeah. How frequent does this happen? Well, there's controversy among that discussion, but a couple comments. We know that we can find a probable genetic cause in about 10% of people with autism. And if you have a genetic cause, it's more likely that you would see it in family members. Now, maybe to a lesser extent, um, but sometimes we'll look at family members and you, you may run into some that you think have prominent social problems or they're very obsessive or ritualistic but functional. But we may be wrong. It may be the um, highly social person in the room where the gene came from. Um, so I think, and sometimes genetic abnormalities can be spontaneous. They just happen in nature. We're finding that more and more rather than being something passed through the family. Um, but I, I, I go back to the environmental issues again, interacting with a genetic predisposition. So as I mentioned, we're very focused on the immune system. And one thing we've found and others have found is if there's a dense family history of autoimmune disorders, let me just name a few so people can hear, multiple sclerosis, uh, lupus, um, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, thyroid disease, psoriasis. Uh, if there's a dense family history of that in first and second degree relatives, we found there's a higher likelihood of having a child with autism. Um, so again, this sort of maybe immune related subtype of autism. So um, hopefully over time, if we can show evidence for things like this, you might have a better idea of what your risk is going into having a child. Mm -hmm. Well, if I have MS myself, as a father or the mother or dense family history of these things, maybe we can find a gene that we can test the parents for earlier in life and at least present them with the risks. They can do what they want. Um, but I, I think over time we're going to begin to identify things that make us vulnerable to environmental uh, exposure. Do you think food is a fact at all? We are what we eat after all. So they say. Well, <laughs> I'll answer it. Uh, sort of. Um, I think that gastrointestinal illness is a factor. In about a third of people with autism have severe stomach, uh, colon, intestine problems. And um, most likely that's due to inflammation. So we think that the people with serious GI disturbance are the, maybe the same subgroup that have this family history of autoimmunity and, and an immune insult at the root. But your other point is right. If food comes into your body, it's a foreign, it's a foreign substance. And if your body is prone to reacting against things that are supposed to be bad, like an immune response, it will react to certain foods, creating food allergies. Um, if you have food allergies, if you have gluten sensitivity to wheat um, called celiac disease and you keep eating wheat, you're going to wreak havoc on your body. And a number of people with autism, autism we think, have food sensitivity. So wow. exposing your body to things that it recognizes as foreign. Well, thank you so much, Dr. McDougal, for taking your time to really explain to us what autism is and to come off years and to actually bring some light into this very, very complex, complex topic. 
thanks for the opportunity. <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, thank you for joining us. And I hope you learned as much as I did. Reporting from the Lewis Center for Autism, I am Queen Banda of WCTV. And I wish you all a wonderful day. Bye.